Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with John Ibbotson on the subject of the Harper government's foreign policy. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week, we're joined on the program by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of international affairs. Today, my guest is John Ibbotson. He is a senior fellow here at the Center for International Governance and Innovation. He's on leave from the Globe and Mail, where he is the chief political writer. He's an acclaimed author, and he's also working on a biography of Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Welcome to the show, John. Hello, Andrew. I will note for our audience that we are filming this just minutes after the shootings on Parliament Hill. And John, I wonder if we could start there. Um, how might this event fit into Prime Minister Harper's foreign policy? Well, as you say, it has only been minutes since we first heard about the shootings on the Hill, and of course all of our thoughts are with um, the families of, uh, of those who have been hurt and indeed uh, killed in the line of duty. Um, I should point out that um, most of your viewers by now will have seen the video footage that the Globe and Mail's Josh Wingrove uh, took of the shooting uh, as it actually took place um, outside the uh, the caucus rooms. And Jeff is 27 years old and a new arrival at the Globe's Bureau and a brilliant young journalist, but I don't think he ever thought that parliamentary reporting would actually end up being combat reporting. So it's going to take us a while to absorb the impact of this. Um, but politics is perpetual and you know that already people are going to be thinking how this triangulates, what it means for the Harper government's foreign policy, what it means for the opposition as they attempt to critique that foreign policy. There's no question that in recent weeks we have seen a cleaving between the Conservatives and the Liberals and New Democrats over the issue of the mission in Iraq. Right. Uh, Prime Minister Harper has sent forces uh, and F-18s into Iraq as part of a coalition. Both the uh, Liberals and the NDP have opposed that mission. So now the question is going to be, how is this attack linked to that mission? I suspect it's very, very soon we're going to hear that um, the attackers were in some way linked to, motivated by, inspired by right. ISIS in Iraq. Um, and that this is one consequence of our decision to go into that mission as well as the Harper government's decision to go into Libya and uh, the Harper, well, the Conservative and the Liberals' decisions to be involved in Afghanistan. These wars uh, exact a price and today is part of that price. But I guess in terms of pure partisan politics, this is now going to be a thing, as they say. Right. This is going to be an issue. It's not just about the economy. It's not just about hope and change versus experience and leadership. It's about two different visions of Canada's role in the world and the consequences for that role in the world. And perhaps we can pick up on the point. Is there an overarching doctrine or vision that the Harper government has for Canada's place in the world? Yes, and it represents a, a fundamental break with what's gone on before. Before, <coughs> we were part of what could be called a Personian tradition. Right. Canada was a joiner of all the right clubs. We believed in multilateral institutions, whether it was the United Nations or the Commonwealth or the Francophonie or other uh, multilateral organizations. We were a nation of peacekeepers. We were a nation of helpful fixers. We tried to look at both sides, tried to uh, keep our powder dry, tried to be uh, you know, an honest referee as best we could. Right. The Harper government exploded all of that. Um, the, the, this Prime Minister does not believe uh, so much in multilateral institutions. He believes right. that they are often ineffective, uh, if not hypocritical. Um, so he's been highly critical of the United Nations. It didn't help that uh, he was turned down for a seat on the Security right. Council. Um, we have boycotted the Commonwealth. Instead of being even-handed in the Middle East, we have become four square in support of Israel. Right. Uh, Foreign Minister John Baird was in the square with the protesters in Kiev even before the old government fell. Prime Minister Harper was the first, I believe, uh, foreign leader to visit Ukraine uh, after the new government uh, took power. So it's a much more, it's a much blunter foreign policy. 
it's a much more values-driven foreign policy. Right. Um, it's uh, it's not subtle, and it is not even-handed. Um, we have wrecked many of the old. Um, we have wrecked the reputation that we used to have for being a multilateral good guy referee type, and we've become instead a much more aggressive and assertive country. Um, and again, it's for Canadians to decide whether they are comfortable with this new values-driven, unsubtle foreign policy, or whether they preferred the older, more Laurentian tradition. Right. And how do you explain this sharp break from the past? Well, I think it's in Stephen Harper's DNA. Right. Uh, even as a teenager, for example, he was vociferous in his support for Israel. He saw it then as he sees it now as a lonely democracy in a violent and unfriendly region filled with states that in some cases are dedicated to the extermination of Israel. So there, so there will be no truck with that other side as far as right. he is concerned. Um, I think as, a, uh, as, someone, as an adopted Westerner, he saw what uh, Daryl Burke and I have called the Laurentian elites uh, obsession with being part of the uh, the multilateral community as weak need, um, as in, as uh, equivocal, and that um, that Canada should uh, should just take a stronger stand. So, in other words, the short answer of that is, I guess, we have the foreign policy we have because Stephen Harper is the kind of person he is, uh, and that's a much more blunt, difficult, um, value-oriented conservative above right. all else. Um, politician, and, and that drives our foreign policy. Thank you very much, John. We'll be back in a moment with John Ibbinson. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. John, every Canadian government has its successes. Pearson has Suez. Trudeau normalized relations with China. Mulroney had free trade. The Creighton government had the Landmines Treaty. Have there been any notable foreign policy successes for the Harper government? I think yes, in the area of trade especially. Um, you mentioned trade under the Mulroney government. Bar Mulroney negotiated, or his government negotiated, the most important trade agreement in Canadian history, free trade with the United States. Stephen Harper has done um, thus far two big things on that front. He, uh, his government negotiated a free trade agreement with the European Union. Right. Once ratified, it will be the biggest trade agreement we have signed since uh, NAFTA, um, and it will give us access to the world's largest market. Potentially even more important, though, um, earlier this year, Canada signed a free trade agreement with Korea. Right. That's the first Asian country that Canada has signed a free trade agreement with, and it signals a fundamental shift in the values and priorities of this government um, towards Asia, away from the Atlantic, towards the Pacific. I think that's the harbinger of things to come. And I think down the road, people are going to look to the free trade agreement with Korea in particular as, as a pivotal moment in Canada's evolution into a Pacific trading power. Right. On the flip side, any notable failures or missed opportunities? Well, as we mentioned, um, Canada failed for the first time in its history to secure a, s a temporary seat on the United Nations Security Council. That certainly is a black mark. Uh, the, in the longer term, did we succeed in our mission in Afghanistan? Did we succeed in our mission in Libya? Did we succeed, or will we succeed, in the mission in Iraq? Um, this has occupied Canada now for more than a decade. The Liberals started it, the Conservatives continued it and right. accelerated it. Um, and one of the things that historians are going to be debating, I think, for decades to come, is whether it was worth the cost in blood and treasure to get involved in that turmoil, and in some cases to make the turmoil even worse than it was before. I don't know whether we should have done it. Right. Uh, time, as they say, will tell. Well, just on that point, um, as you noted, we've been at war since 2001, first in Afghanistan and now as part of the coalition against the Islamic State. Um, in Iraq and Syria. And for all intents and purposes, the Harper government has only known times of war while it's, it's governed. How has this shaped its worldview, do you think? Well, it's, it's for one thing, it has changed our notion of what war is. Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct, Andrew, that ever since 9-11, arguably, the West has been at war 
with Islamic, uh, Islamic extremism uh, in, in one shape or another. Of course, it's very different from real war. And I say mm. that as the son of, of uh, a father who fought in the Second World War. Right. I just came back from South Korea, where even now the, the, the trauma of the Korean War is, uh, is, is visible. I was actually at the United Nations Cemetery looking at the graves of the Canadian war dead. So there's war and then there's war. Right. And this is not that kind of war. What it is is a, a perpetual heightened tension, um, a perpetual um, conflict between the needs of national security and uh, the rights of citizens, those privacy rights. I think the Harper government has probably erred, if at all, on the side of national security. Right. It is more concerned about finding and deterring uh, bad people from doing bad things than it is about protecting the privacy rights of citizens. I think during the calm periods in, in this conflict, uh, we have tended to ask ourselves whether government's gone too far, right. uh, whether we are sacrificing individual civil liberties. I think today, in particular though, uh, the shoe is on the other foot. Right. Um, I wonder if we could shift gears slightly. There are some who argue that at the end of the day, the only relationship that really matters for Canada is the Canada-US relationship. How has the Harper government managed that file? And specifically, or put another way, how are we received in Washington? And perhaps specifically, how are we received at the White House? Well, there's a flow to Canada-US relations, and it more or less coincides with the arriving and departing of administrations. Um, important to remember, the, you know, the Mulroney period lasted about 10 years. The Crenshaw right. period lasted about 10 years. The Harper period is going to last at least about 10 years. Um, and it always starts the same way. Each new government comes into power here determined to fix the mess that the previous government left us in. Right. Um, so there's a new initiative, new building of bridges, new attempt to revitalize things. And then there's this kind of steady accumulation of grievances. And over the course of a decade, they add up until finally the situation seems to be positively seized. And then a new administration comes in and you know, sets out to fix it all again. Right. And that's what we've seen here. Um, Harper came into power after the relationship between Canada and the U.S. had reached a particularly low point over with the Chrétien government's refusal to go into Iraq, the right. ongoing softwood lumber dispute, uh, and other tensions, ballistic missile defense that the Paul Martin government had decided not to participate in. Stephen Harper was determined to fix all that and to get right. things back on the right foot. In fact, one of the first things the government did after coming to power was to settle the softwood lumber dispute. Once Barack Obama came into office, that presented another new opportunity. He's enormously popular with Canadians. I think there was a poll that said about two-thirds of Canadians would rather vote for Barack Obama than vote for anyone in Canada, right. given the chance. Um, so the two leaders used that opportunity to launch the Beyond the Border initiative, to create a continental security perimeter, to ease congestion at the border in return. There was even some hope of regulatory reform, of harmonizing the regulatory regimes between the two countries so that ketchup would look the same on both sides of the border. Um, that has mostly been accomplished in principle, though not necessarily so much in fact, mostly just because of, uh, of lack of money. Right. Uh, it's expensive to create new border facilities, and the Americans don't have the money. But there's going to be a new bridge between Windsor and Detroit, and that's a good thing. So right. all of that is on the plus side. Right. On the negative side, again, it's the steady accumulation of grievances. The big one, of course, was the Obama decision, uh, administration's decision not to approve, at least up until now, the Keystone XL right. pipeline. Uh, the Harvard government was furious at that. They were also uh, chagrined at the onerous conditions that the Americans put on Canada's accession into the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks, right. which involves 12 Pacific nations and that are still underway and actually quite bogged down. They really made it hard for us to get in. And um, again, there was a feeling in Ottawa that friends don't do to friends what Washington did to Ottawa to get Canada into those talks. So I think by now we're at a point where um, things are, are at the lowest point they've been since the uh, uh, Conservatives came to power. And it's going to take a fresh election, maybe not necessarily a change of, of government, but certainly right. a fresh election, at least maybe a new president, uh, to get things back on track. Right. Thank you very much, John. We will be back in a moment with John Ibbotson. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter.
Welcome back. John, I wonder if we might talk about some of the external influences on the Harper government's foreign policy. Uh, Prime Minister Harper has been described as the elder statesman of the Anglosphere, uh, a grouping of Canada, the United Kingdom, and Australia, where they're all conservative, like-minded governments. Uh, they are in contact with each other regularly. How have these countries influenced the Harper government's foreign policy, defense policy, issues around climate change, citizenship rights, etc.? Well, I think Stephen Harper was a believer in the Anglosphere from a way back. Again, it fits with his implicit rejection of multilateralism. Right. That Canada, in fact, is a country closely allied to a few other countries that have shared values. Certainly Australia, Great Britain, and New Zealand uh, are all are part of that, uh, integral to that. Right. They're democracies. Um, they share uh, the same values in terms of human rights. So again, for him, it's more important to foster and protect those alliances um, than to be part of um, larger uh, groupings such as the Commonwealth. Indeed, you'll note that um, the Harper government boycotted the Commonwealth meeting in Sri Lanka, even though the uh, Great Britain, Australia, and New Zealand attended that right. meeting. So in fact, we go farther than in, in this sense than, um, than, than some of our other allies. But I think at root, it's a very plain, common sense uh, approach that says, let's not be subtle, let's not be nuanced, let's uh, figure out who our friends are, stick with them, and um, as for those who aren't our friends, we don't really need them so much. And maybe building on that point, I think it's fair to say that the Harper government has not engaged with civil society actors in Canada. And in some cases, I'm thinking of environmental groups, but also some human rights groups. It has been quite hostile and antagonistic to, to these groups who traditionally have had some voice and some influence in the shaping of Canadian foreign policy. Where is this hostility coming from? Again, I think it has to do with, the Harper, with Stephen Harper's own personal hostility towards the Laurentian elites, right. the political, bureaucratic, media, uh, governmental, academic, cultural elites in the major cities uh, in Ottawa and Quebec. Uh, certainly environmental groups are part of that. Um, Harper completely rejects uh, the, the Kyoto, rejected the Kyoto Protocol right. um, as inimical to Canada's um, economic best interests. And I think really blames those groups as well as the, uh, the Liberals for getting us into the mess in the first place of signing a, a treaty that we never had any possibility of being able to implement. But in the, in the broader context, I think as well, um, this is very much uh, uh, your first or your Guinness government. There right. are Three out of ten Canadians support this government hell or high water. Uh, they, you know, vote for it in every election. Uh, have stuck with it, with it even through the uh, the Senate expenses scandal. One in ten Canadians is uh, what I call uh, among the grouping known as the persuadables. Okay. They might vote conservative. They might not vote conservative. And everything this government does, everything, is about entrenching support in the base and then going after the persuadables. Right. Um, they need, you know, five of those 10 percent of the electors to vote for them if they're going to form a government, and they need almost all of them if they're, they're to form a majority government. Right. So everything they do, they do for them. As for the other six and 10 Canadians, well, they're never going to vote conservative anyway, ever. So why would you waste a breath on them? Um, it is a very polarizing way to govern, and it has created a more polarized society than we've ever had before. Right. But it's how they do things. And related to this, there have been budget cuts at Foreign Affairs. There has been the recent amalgamation of CETA into what is now the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. Um, what is your sense of uh, where Canada's Foreign Service sits right now with respect to the foreign policy process? Well, it's, it's, it sits in the woodshed. <laughs> I don't think there is much time or respect either uh, for the, by the Harper government for the Foreign Service or by the Foreign Service for the Harper government. Right. Each is inimical to the other. It's sad, really, because both have skills that uh, they can bring to, to the situation. But this government operates out of the Prime Minister's office, out of the office of the Minister of Foreign Affairs with a close-knit circle of advisors. Um, and as for the line officers, including even many of the ambassadors, 
um, in the Foreign Service. They're seen as part of that old Personian tradition, right. um, which they, they are seen as not helpful. They're seen as an internal opposition to the government. And in some, in some ways, they're right. If you talk to the guys at, at right. DFAT-D, as it's supposed to be called, or defeated, as it gets <laughs> called uh, uh, in Ottawa, right. um, they feel exactly that way about the Harper government. They can't wait to see them gone. And the, uh, the, you know, the, the status quo ante returned. So um, that's just the way it is. It has been like that now for about 10 years and will go on, I suspect, for as long as the Conservatives go on. Great. Thank you very much, John. We will be back in a moment with John Ibbinson. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. John, I wonder if we might end the, the program by reflecting on how others in the world view Canada, perhaps outside the Anglosphere, but how, how does the world view us right now? Well, the, I think the good news is they, they still view us as a pretty fine place. Uh, polls show this is still a country that people want to come to, would rather live in, the, in, in most parts of the world, they'd rather live here than where they live right now. Right. Um, and uh, so that, you know, that reputation remains. I think among the elites within the councils of, of foreign policy, in Europe and in Asia, there's a feeling that Canada has retreated since the 1990s. It began before the Conservatives came to power, but it certainly has accelerated, that we aren't at the tables we used to be at, that we don't make the contribution we used to make. That said, the, the government has been there when it counted. Right. People who say, where has Canada gone? Right. What happened to Canada? Well, we were there in Afghanistan. We were there in Libya. We helped in Mali. We're there in Iraq now. So where do you, well, if you want to know where we were, we were on the front lines fighting is where we were. Um, I think as well, there is a, a belated appreciation on the part of the Harper government that they've dropped the ball in Asia, that um, our Pacific trading relationships are going to be increasingly important over time. Uh, that China is Canada's second largest trading partner and that we have to uh, improve relations with China, notwithstanding the human rights abuses that go on there. Right. So um, I think in, in much of the world, the answer would be Canada's gone missing. In parts of the world, uh, the answer would be uh, Canada's on the front lines, uh, just as it always was. And in certain parts of the world, especially uh, in, in Asia and the Pacific, uh, Canada has returned. Um, and they're just wondering where it was we we went. Right. And perhaps we can end by, with a terribly unfair question, you know, <laughs> recognizing that um, the Harper government, you know, has not done its term in office, that there's still, uh, you know, perhaps a lot of governing for it, it to do. What do you suspect might be the foreign policy legacy of this government? I think it will, for better or for worse, be seen as, a t uh, as I call it the big break in right. a paper that I wrote for, uh, for CG, that, it, that under Harper, Canada largely abandoned its Laurentian, Personian, multilateral traditions, became more aggressive, became more rights-oriented, became uh, less friendly to those with whom we are not friends to begin with, right. uh, and in exchange perhaps more friendly to those, towards those who were, with whom we were already friends. Canada that pursued a much less subtle, much less nuanced foreign policy. Also, it was a foreign policy that um, was driven uh, by diasporas, by uh, communities inside Canada. 1.3 million Ukrainians in Canada. Well, guess who <laughs> was in the square uh, showing solidarity to Ukraine? Right. So, and, and I think, uh, you know, political scientists such as yourself will probably despair over how vulgar some aspects of the Harper government's foreign policy became. As for the guy in the street, they probably didn't notice much of a difference, and to the extent they did notice, they probably liked what they saw. John, it has been wonderful having you on the show. It's been a real treat. Best of luck with the, the biography. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for tuning in today. Please join us again for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter.